Welcome everyone. We'll give uh, people just a couple more minutes to join us and then we'll get started. Okay, welcome. Um, welcome to the first of three webinars this spring uh, focused on Native nations and climate change. So this webinar series is a collaboration between the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center or the Southwest CASC and the National Park Service Tribal Engagement and Climate Change Work Group. And today's webinar will be on fire and humans and resilient ecosystems of the American Southwest. I am Sarah Leroy. I'm the Science Communications Coordinator for the Southwest CASC, which is housed at the University of Arizona in Tucson. The University of Arizona is on the land and territories of Indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Autumn and the Yaqui. Uh, so first, to just a few logistics. I'll first briefly introduce the Southwest CASC. And then Pam Benjamin with the National Park Service will introduce the, the work group. And she will then turn it over to our speaker, Rachel Lohman, for the presentation. Um, after the presentation, we will have some time for Q&A. Uh, and we might even answer some questions in the middle of the talk as well. So if you have a question uh, for Rachel, please type it in the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'd also like to ask everyone to please introduce yourself in the chat by typing in your name and affiliation. I see people are already doing that as well, so thank you. So a brief intro to the, the Southwest CASC. Uh, the Southwest CASC is a collaborative partnership between the U.S. Geological Survey and universities and institutions in Arizona, California, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. Um, our vision is that the Southwest's ecosystems, communities, and cultures are resilient and thriving as the climate changes. Resource management decisions are informed by climate adaptation science. And so our mission then is to develop actionable science and implementable climate adaptation solutions in partnership with natural and cultural resource managers, policymakers, Native nations, and researchers across the Southwest. Um, adding to that, we provide objective scientific information, tools, and techniques that land, water, wildlife, and cultural resource managers and other interested parties can apply to anticipate, monitor, and adapt to climate variations and changes in the Southwest U.S. Um, and we also foster collaboration between scientists and resource managers. So here is my contact information and our website if you'd like to learn more and I'll paste both of my email address and the website into the chat as well. Um, on our website, among other things, you can sign up for a newsletter, listen to our podcast and, and find information about our fellowship and other funding opportunities that we might be offering in the future. And so with that, I will turn it over to Pam to introduce the Park Service Tribal Engagement and Climate Change Work Group, and also introduce our speaker. Thanks, Sarah, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us with the kickoff of our second Native Nations and Climate Change webinar series. And I want to send many thanks to the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center for hosting this year's webinar series.
and especially to Sarah, who's done the yeoman's work of coordinating and getting this all set up so that we could have uh, the webinars this year. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Pam Benjamin, and I work for the National Park Service Intermountain Regional Office, specifically in the Landscape Conservation and Climate Change Program. I coordinate climate change response activities for both natural and cultural resources. And I also facilitate the MPS tribal engagement and climate change community of practice that Sarah just introduced. The uh, tribal engagement and climate change community of practice is really a grassroots informal group that's focused on information exchange to enhance tribal engagement in addressing resource management issues associated with climate change. Uh, boy, this group was started back in, I believe, 2019, and we have participants from across the country, uh, not only in the MPS, but in other federal agencies, academia, as well as tribal participants. The group is really dedicated to enhancing uh, tribal engagement through improving communications, not only amongst ourselves, but to a broader audience. And specifically, uh, the use of webinars to highlight climate change projects and programs that emphasize the benefits of engaging with our tribal partners is one of the best ways that we feel we can reach this broader audience and also uh, to encourage additional tribal engagement. I will drop my email into the chat uh, for those of you that may want some more information or who may be actually interested in joining the group. And I'll do that just as soon as I introduce our speaker today, who is Dr. Rachel Lohman. Rachel is a landscape and fire ecologist with the US Geological Survey. Her research focuses on the role of natural and anthropogenic disturbances in shaping ecological patterns and processes. Uh, she is involved with numerous exciting um, uh, research projects, but she does most of her work in boreal and tundra ecosystems uh, in Alaska, as well as in forests and woodlands of the interior west and southwestern U.S. Uh, the title of Rachel's presentation today is Fire and Humans in Resilient Ecosystems of the American Southwest. So with that, I will turn the screen back over to Sarah and Rachel and let them get us started. Thanks, Pam. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you. OK, I'm going to get through my first hurdle and try to share my screen. Looks good. OK, sounds good. Thank you. Um, OK, well, thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to be able to share um, some of my perspectives and some um, examples of some recent uh, relevant work with you all. Um, I wish that we were all together in person and this could be more interactive um, because as much as I hope to share some information with you, um, I would really like to learn from you all um, some, some questions or answers to questions that I'll pose about how this type of work that I'm going to share with you can be integrated into the way that we think about ecosystems, manage lands now and for the future, um, and just do a better job of integrating uh, multiple cultural natural perspectives into um, our, our vulnerable ecosystems. So um, I'm gonna try to get through maybe half of these slides and then take a pause to see if there are any um, questions or comments for discussion that we can use to make this a little bit more interactive. But um, I guess for the, the time being, um, bear with a little bit of a monologue. And then um, I'm also really terrible at trying to read the chat and talk at the same time. And so Sarah's gonna be the moderator. So if, if I don't call out your question, it's, it's probably because I just am not um, capable of talking and reading it at the same time. Um, but before I launch into the slides, are there any, um, I don't know, any, is there, are there any questions that I can take care of um, right away? Doesn't look like we have any yet. Okay, perfect. Go for let's it. Get, let's get started then. Okay, so um, the idea that humans have influenced fire regimes and influenced ecological systems um, around the globe is not a new concept. So you can, this is just a, a very uh, short list of some examples of work that's been done that show that kind of influence of humans, anthropogenic influence of humans on fire regimes. You know, as early as 1944, looking at North American grasslands, 
um, looking at, at Eastern forests, uh, New Zealand forests, um, the Pacific Northwest, and then California grasslands. There is a, a, a growing awareness of the fact that humans and fire are inextricably linked and that, um, that really our ecological landscapes are also cultural landscapes. And so this is sort of a central tenet of a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the work that, um, that many of us do. Uh, and so I wanna talk a little bit about, about what that means, that, that linked cultural natural perspective. So first of all, um, integrating cultural and natural perspectives requires interdisciplinary work and, and some co-production in terms of perspectives, um, in terms of land management, and research in terms of tribal perspectives with non-tribal perspectives. And then this mingling of disciplines from ecology to anthropology, um, to geology, uh, silviculture, this wide variety of, of disciplines. And that makes it really exciting. Um, it also makes it uh, you know, more complicated to do than you know, maybe a, a more linear process. Um, another really fundamental part of, of thinking about ecological landscapes as cultural landscapes is thinking about um, not just one way interactions, but reciprocal interactions. So, so the slide, the previous slide showed some examples from the literature of this fundamental role that humans have in shaping fire regimes and ecosystems across the globe. But um, in, from the anthropological side, there is, is a sort of a similar growing awareness that um, landscape context, fire, ecosystem dynamics, uh, land resources are really integral to shaping uh, human biological evolution and also the evolution of, of cultures um, across the globe. So, so we cannot separate uh, ecology and humans in that manner. And then I think this perspective uh, is really applicable to our contemporary land management challenges. And so I've just listed some of these here and I would be really interested to make this list longer and broader and, and more meaningful with the help of this audience. But, but when we're thinking about resilience and sustainability or wildfire risk in the WUI and in our wildlands, um, in how to manage for desired conditions, um, in, in something like what is the concept of naturalness, how to restore ecological processes, issues of tribal sovereignty, tribal land use, resource availability, all of these, these, these true sort of soci social ecological challenges are completely linked to this concept of, of coupled human natural systems through, um, through pretty deep time. So the, the landscape that I'm gonna to use to, um, to talk about these concepts is the Jemez Mountains of Northern New Mexico. It's, it's um, sort of my, it's my front yard, I guess. It's north of where I live in Albuquerque. It's a place um, I've lived a really long time and a place that I've been lucky enough to work, for, work in for maybe the past uh, 20 years as a researcher and before that as an archeologist. Um, and the Jemez Mountains is ecologically a really diverse landscape. Uh, you know, ecosystems from low elevation uh, grasslands all the way up to high elevation subalpine forests and just about every forest type um, in between. It's also an incredibly culturally rich and complex landscape. It's, it's one of our most, it's one of our cultural treasures in terms of the, the landscapes of the Southwest. Um, there is a huge density of archeological uh, sites on this landscape. And it's also a landscape that has enormous cultural significance for, um, for living peoples who are the descendants of those ancestral populations. And so, um, so the, the uh, photo on the left shows a, a pretty good view of that um, kind of uh, ecological range um, ending in the background with Redondo Peak, which is a sacred peak to the Hemish people um, who are central to this landscape. And then in the, in the top right um, is a, is, um, a, a part of a study area um, where I did some modeling that I'll talk about. And the, in, the, in the black outline are a series of gray and red dots. Those are the known archeological sites um, within the heavily occupied part of the Hamas, um, the Hamas Mountains up until about the 14th, uh, maybe the 15th century. And the gray dots are kind of smaller sites and the red dots are these very large Pueblos. And so this represents a population density that at times was was larger, well, it was a larger population and at times a more dense population than um, the population of, of London, England at the same time period. And so 
um, this human footprint is really profound on this landscape and it exists today as well. The photo on the bottom right shows a, what, what we call a field house, but a small structure um, still in the Hamas Mountains in the middle of uh, fire excluded forest, second or third growth. But um, those, those rocks are the remains of standing walls. Um, so this is a place where people lived and worked for you know, centuries. So the, the project um, that I'm gonna describe in a bit of detail uh, is one that was highly interdisciplinary uh, within academia and agency research, but also highly collaborative across um, tribal with, with tribal partners. And um, the, the shorthand name for it, uh, we call Fahire, Fire and Humans in Resilient Ecosystems. Um, the first phase was funded by the National Science Foundation. We have a second phase proposal in review right now and are hopeful to, to be able to continue this work. Um, but the, the principal research team is Tom Swetnam from University of Arizona, Chris Rose, Southern Methodist University, Matt Liebman from Harvard. Um, I'm there, John Welch, who's at Simon Fraser University and TJ Ferguson, both anthropologists. Um, and then some Forest Service collaborators, Bob Keen and Lisa Holsinger. And then we work closely with the Pueblo of Jemez, um, in particular, Chris Toya and John Galvan and then also with the Hopi tribe, White Mountain Apache tribe, Pueblo of Zuni, and then um, we have some Forest Service and Park Service collaborators who are really integral to this work. Um, so this, everything I'm describing isn't me alone. In fact, um, this couldn't have been done without uh, all of us here working together. And if you're interested, the best uh, summary of all of the parts of this work is from this Archaeology Southwest magazine that came out a couple of years ago. And I think we have some hard copies floating around um, I can send out, but also uh, you should be able to get it online. And it, there are a two or three page papers related to each facet of the project in there. And it's a, it's a really nice kind of compendium of that project. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions now. Not yet. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the Hamas Mountains and um, the challenges that we face there with land management. If you're familiar with the Southwest, um, you'll know that the Hamas Mountains uh, were the, the site of one of the most uh, significant fires that we've had in a long time um, in the Southwest, which is the Lust Conscious Fire in 2011. That fire had an extremely large high severity component. Um, it burned across a large uh, swath of uh, ponderosa pine, so dry forest um, in the Hamas Mountains, but and that's what you see on the left. So that's high severity fire within ponderosa pine. Um, it also burned within pinyon juniper woodlands, which is fairly unusual for fire that's in the bottom right. And then the indirect effects of that fire were also extremely profound. In the top right, um, there is a photo of an erosion channel on the Vice Caldera that occurred um, after the less conscious fire is the result of destabilized um, soils and, and heavy rainfall. And so th this was a, a land transforming event. Um, many people have discussed the idea that, that the vegetation communities and maybe the underlying um, geology and soils of this landscape will never be the same again. Um, of course, uh, it's interesting to think about this longer term perspective and whether this was characteristic or not. And, and um, I can tell you based on, you know, many, many long term bodies or many bodies of work that cover centuries to millennial timescales that this was truly transformative and unusual in the, the magnitude of um, the disturbance footprint and, and its severity. So this is the landscape in which we're working and this is the landscape that um, many of us are challenged to think about in terms of ecological restoration, resilience, and then, and then management implications. So um, this leads us to sort of the, what I'm calling a central challenge, but was also a central focus of this, um, this Fahir project, this collaborative project. And that's this idea that for centuries in the past and, and really for you know, maybe even a couple thousand years, um, people within this Hamas Mountains landscape lived within what are fire prone, fire dependent, but seemingly resilient ecosystems. Um, ecosystems that typify the beautiful relationship of dry forest, climate, and wildfire as sort of self reinforcing uh, resilient ecosystems. But today, after you know, really only uh, a century, 
of, of, um, of habitation and management of these landscapes, we struggle to maintain them in any kind of functioning form. So, so the question is why, but then the, the, the bigger question is knowing that uh, humans lived within this landscape in a fairly, let's say sustainable manner um, in the past, is there anything that we can learn from, from that, uh, that ancestral uh, land use and land occupation to think about how to do a better job managing now and for the future. And so that's sort of the, again, that's the central challenge of, of this project, but also um, one that I think we have overall in this landscape. So in order to try to answer this question, address this challenge, um, it's necessary to do some reconstruction of the past. And, and uh, a, a, that is a challenging notion, the archeological record, um, is not absolute. Um, not all things are, are preserved or conserved within the archeological record. Um, other data sources like tree rings, uh, fire scars in tree rings are, um, are, are really valuable parts of the, the past fire and forest record, but they too are incomplete. Um, soil cores, other kinds of uh, reconstructions of vegetations, uh, of vegetation and past fire regimes are useful, but again, uh, we don't collect them from everywhere, and um, and you know they're subject to fading record problems and other issues of incomplete uh, data sets. We have um, living descendants of ancestral peoples, but um, again, it, you know it's it's not possible to reconstruct the the behaviors and land uses and um, sort of cultural history of peoples from a few hundred to a thousand years ago, um, based solely on the, the knowledge from contemporary peoples. Um, and so we have these important questions and uh, the material record of the past and the living record of the past is not always likely to provide them. So, so some of those important questions that relate to how people and fire and, and ecosystems interact are things like, through the period of time when ancestral peoples lived in the Hamas Mountains, how many people were there? Uh, where did they live? Um, how did they interact with the surrounding landscape? And, and I'm a fire and forest ecologist, and this was a, a project uh, focused on fire and forests. And so we think about interactions with fire, interactions with uh, fuels, and then, and then the, the result of those things on forest structure and composition. And then what were intentional and incidental actions, land, you know, effectively land management actions, ecological engineering, um, and what were their effects? And then finally, given all of those things that I just listed, what are the cumulative impacts on ecosystems and fire regimes from the past, those that we see now, and how those might carry on into the future? So I think it was uh, Faulkner said something like the, the past isn't was the past isn't isn't past the past isn't dead it isn't even really past or something like that i don't know you all probably know somebody can put it in the chat box but but i want to make make this important point that um the landscape that we have today is like this uh there's a word palimpsest which means that it, uh, it's a accumulation of different sort of layers of activity or or um you know different sorts of things happening through time and that's really what we see on many of our landscapes is that um, they are the they represent the cumulative effect of lots and lots of um, human and, and natural act, you know activities and processes through time. And so this is just one photo from um, from the Hamas Mountains showing a whole range of things. And um, so, for example, uh, we have a high cut stump that represents early logging, um, you know, the cross cut saw before chainsaws. We have fuels accumulated on the ground um, that that would not have been present in a free fire environment. We have uh, wall alignments, that's the arrow on the far right, um, showing uh, you know, a field house or, or um, an ancestral dwelling site. Um, we have uh, some, some stand conditions that are indicative of fire excluded environment where we have Douglas fir, a shade tolerant tree growing up in the midst of um, of dry ponderosa pine forests. We have small diameter ponderosa pines um, that tell us that you know, this is second or third growth forest. And then in that inset box, we see a, a lithic scatter. So um, uh, flakes from tool making, 
And, and those show us that this is a, a place where um, people in the past you know, spent time and worked um, and, and did some activities, but also um, what this photo is showing is, is pedestaling. And so um, the, the soil development or the, the amount of soil and the type of soil on this landscape is the result of um, about 6 million sheep uh, grazing uh, a little more than uh, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Um, change created in an, an incredible erosive environment. And so what was you know, pretty rich soil, volcanic soil, um, has been eroded away into gullies. And so even the, the substrate on which current vegetation communities grow um, is really different than in the past. So, so we have to factor these legacies into how we view the landscape of today. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about how we did this project. Um, it, there were a lot of moving pieces um, and I'm just gonna give examples um, kind of, of, of each of them. So, so in order to um, get at those questions of where people lived in the past, what they did that might relate to current um, and future uh, ecological patterns and processes, and then how people interacted with fire and forest depends on all these different parts coming together, all these different types of reconstructions. And so um, the first thing that our, our group did, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we, but we had you know, different areas of expertise, different um, sort of leads on each, and, and I'm happy to connect you with uh, specific uh, group members um, after this talk. But we used archaeological methods to basically um, provide some information on what uh, the ancestral Hamish population size might have been and and what kinds of uh, use there, there may have been in the past for um, forest resources. And so the orange and blue bar chart is, is showing high and low um, population levels reconstructed from a LIDAR based analysis, which is the photo kind of yellowish photo in the top right, LIDAR based analysis of the size of um, some of these big uh, Pueblo sites where, where people lived and uh, linked to um, particular time periods using, uh, using ceramics dating. So um, dating of archeological ceramics. So essentially um, what, what I hope comes out, well, first of all, that we, we can't have a fixed idea of population size. We don't know exactly how many people were living in each of these um, periods that are uh, written in black uh, along the X axis of that, of that graph, but populations changed through time. Um, there was a, a particularly a period of particularly large population um, from about the mid 1400s to the mid 1600s, what, what archeologists call early and late Jemez cultural phases. Um, and on the tails of that, uh, that period of dense occupation, we have lower populations culminating in a, a really precipitous, almost 90% decrease in population associated with um, Spanish occupation in the Pueblo Revolt. And so, um, so that, the graph on the bottom with the red line is, is reconstructed Palmer drought, Palmer drought severity index. So of a measure of aridity. And so I just I make the point here that these population levels are superimposed on um, a climate regime that is operating in the background that in and itself uh, has a strong influence on, um, on cultural development and available resources. So this is a complicated landscape people changing through time in terms of how many people there were and where they lived. Um, but, but we did our best to reconstruct what those levels might be. Um, we, had, we used ethnographic methods. So using um, collaborators uh, from Jemez Pueblo to develop some ideas about what ancestral fire and fuel would use might have been. And I, I wanna spend a bit of time um, on this slide because it's, it's a single slide, but it represents an enormous um, amount of investment from our tribal partners and enormous amount of trust in, in uh, sharing this information. And then it, a really amazing and innovative effort by um, the, our ethnographers, uh, TJ and John in consolidating this information into this really cool graphic that so, so um, in those outward migrating circles, we're moving from a more local scale of the sort of the home, the area around a home, to a, a broader landscape scale of forests and woodlands. And within those circles, um, we have different uses for uh, fire and fuel wood um, associated with each of those scales. 
So um, at the, the sort of the home scale, we see um, fuel use for heating, cooking. Um, we see fire use for clearing land, um, uh, fuel wood for firing pottery um, in outdoor fire pits. We move to the sort of the village scale. Um, we have uh, more community activities like um, corn roasting pits that would have required um, a pretty substantial input of fuel wood. We have fires that are burned in kivas um, for ritual activities. Um, and then we look at the level of, of the field. So those would be the agricultural fields that supported those sometimes very large populations I mentioned. Um, we have clearing of fields, preparation of fields each year, um, fires associated with um, cooking and heating activities for when people lived outside of the large pueblos and, and, and near to agricultural fields, um, smoldering fires to deter pests. And again, these activities and these fuel wood uses are all provided by our um, tribal collaborators. And then when we look at the broader landscape scale, um, we have different activities that are, are sort of more distant from the permanent uh, dwelling sites. So signal fires, um, uh, killing and using trees for building and heating, bringing them back to, um, to more permanent settlement sites, um, using fire to promote um, important plant species uh, and then you know camp activities and so um, the I have a citation for a pretty recent paper um, where you can find this graphic um, if you're interested in in looking at it more closely so then we used uh, dendrochronology and paleoecology so that's soil coring methods um, to reconstruct vegetation and fire regimes within um, areas within our broader study area um, and so we, we looked particularly around first um, some of these large village sites that where we reconstructed populations and looked at the pattern of, um, of, of tree growth um, to get an idea of when uh, those settlements were used versus um, when they fell out of use and then, uh, and then to reconstruct stand dynamics, look for fire patterns, um, and then look for a, a very um, long-term signal of both pollen to uh, reconstruct vegetation type and then soil charcoal to link that vegetation type to particular fire regimes. And so all of, all of these things that I've described, uh, maybe minus the, the ethnographic information are sort of uh, point-based um, types of information. So you, we reconstruct populations based on fixed archeological sites. Uh, we look at you know, specific areas for um, to do tree ring analyses or soil coring um, and, and try to make inferences about the broader landscape. But to really couple all of this information into um, sort of the dynamic framework in which ecosystems or coupled human natural systems really exist, right? Where you have multiple generations of, of people in forests and fires that are having a, a sort of a mingled influence um, takes some other techniques. And, and that's where my part of the project came in. And that, that was to um, sort of harness the, the power of a uh, spatial ecosystem fire model, it happens to be called FireBGC, to link all of these disparate sources of information into one common framework. So we could essentially ask questions about the past um, and these linked processes and look for sort of emergent properties, things that you can't see with a single data set alone or data sets that are in these um, finite places on the landscape. Um, and so, uh, and, and the other benefit of using a model is, as I described with, um, with population, you know, we, we will never know a precise number for, you know, people who lived in the Hamas Mountains in 1530 um, AD, for example. But um, we, we have these maybe a lower bound and an upper bound, but the number of people and what those people did on a landscape in the past really matters. And so um, we can use a model to create scenarios, um, sort of what if, what if, what if population was on that lower bound, but people did this other thing. So I'm going to go through um, this sort of series of, of, of what ifs um, kind of trajectories that created the scenarios. Um, that we looked at. So, so I talked about population. We had these reconstructions, but you know can't fix it an actual number. So we have a, kind of a lower estimate for for different time periods and an upper estimate. In terms of fuel wood use, we we got information about why people used fuels 
and where they might have been, you know, harvesting and 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 for these fuels and for which purposes. But the amount of fuel would really matter because, of course, fire burns fuel, and and really we're trying to reconstruct in part past fire regimes. So from the ethnographic record, there are a variety of estimates of of what kind what amount of fuel would be necessary for people to use um, given you know climate conditions. Again, were reconstructed. Um, and so those are, you know, a low estimate from the literature about one cord per person per year or a high estimate, which is double that. Um, in terms of structural wood use, we, we actually had a pretty good handle on that because uh, this is such a, a nice uh, environment for wood preservation um, on archaeological sites in particular that, that we actually um, were able to estimate timber use pretty well. And so we represented that as one um, live tree harvested per person per year. Um, ignitions are um, in, in an interesting issue. Um, so uh, the the number, the amount, the location of human ignitions obviously can have a, a very large impact on where fires burn and how they burn. So we modeled uh, human no human ignitions at all. So kind of a saturated fire environment based on lightning ignitions or um, some augmented uh, ignitions. And then agricultural land use is, is um, also an area where you know, we don't have a fixed number. So we looked at uh, sort of a, a moderate um, scenario of agricultural land use where um, we, we had a, you know, some added ignitions to reflect that uh, cultural burning associated with um, preparation and maintenance of fields, and then a, a more, intensive, um, more intensive one. And so, um, so the area where, where these activities were modeled is that human footprint in the black line where we see um, the, the archaeological sites in our, uh, in our record. And then on the far right, I'm showing just two examples of how um, the, the choice of these trajectories matter. And, and this is in terms of um, the amount of area that it would have taken to support the fuel wood needs of these populations based on these scenarios. So LP, LF is, is low population, low fuel wood. So that's that's the column um, on the left side of, of that two column figure. So low population is at each time period, which are effectively on the Y axis, the lower bound of our reconstructed population and low fuel wood is that one cord per person per year. And, and the, the colored part of the, um, the panels is the that human footprint area where we assume that people were um, doing most of their um, sort of resource use activities. That's the, the more dry um, or dry music forest type. And so going through um, going through time, and again, early Hamas and late Hamas, if you'll remember, is the period where populations were the highest. Under that low population, low fuel wood scenario, we don't, we don't, uh, it doesn't require that full, that entire human footprint to satisfy um, the fuel wood resources that we specify in the model. So um, there weren't enough people uh, you, with enough of that fuel wood need to basically deplete the fuel wood resource. But if we move to the most intensive scenario, skipping all the ones in the middle, high population, and then um, uh, structural fuel wood harvest in addition to this kind of intensive agricultural scenario. Basically, once you get past this initial period where the population of the Hamas Mountains was starting to become established, it, it took all of that land area to provide a sufficient amount of fuel wood. And in fact, um, within the early Hamas and late Hamas periods of, of high population um, numbers and, and population density, um, there just wasn't enough uh, fuel wood as represented in, in this um, modeling framework to satisfy the need. So Rachel, yeah, we do have a couple of questions if you'd like oh, to address perfect. that. Yeah. Yep. So okay. first one, could you say more about the human ignitions? Does this refer to deliberate or inadvertent human oh. ignitions? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So from the from the perspective of the model, it doesn't it doesn't matter. I mean, it's it's ignitions that are added um, uh, over the the background level of ignitions. And I should say about this this model, FireBGC. So it's it's spatial, meaning that it it works on real world topography. Um, we represent individual trees, uh, their establishment, their growth, their mortality as they grow their contribution to surface fuel loads. Um, 
It's got about 200 parameters that describe each plant in the model. And so um, the, the plant representation is, is very um, uh, precise and, and complex. And then the interaction of fire and plants is as well. We calibrate the model to um, all kinds of baseline data um, and, and try to match you know, all the observed records we can get. And so fire is part of that. And so um, the, the natural ignitions that we model are um, what are the, the known you know, sort of pattern of lightning ignitions. For our augmented ignitions, our human ignitions, we distributed those according to those you know, high and low um, scenarios within that human footprint um, associated with, with agricultural fields. And those agricultural fields have locations that are, are somewhat known based on the distribution of the field houses that are assumed to support those agricultural activities, the, the archeological field houses. So, um, so based on the ethnographic uh, work that we did, we're assuming that those ignitions represent intentional ignitions um, for land clearing, for um, uh, maintaining fields, burning off, you know, old, old vegetation, um, opening forests for, to create fields. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, and then one more question. Uh, this one's from Don Falk. So what do we know about the stability of lightning rates over long periods of time, like centuries? Do these rates vary in some known way or do we have to assume a stationary process? Well, yeah, so um, thank you for that question. Uh, so it, it's kind of a yes and no, right? So at, at the scale at which we included um, climate and then by association lightning in this model, I, it's, it's, uh, there's not a fixed number of ignitions per, um, per year uh, because, um, but within that climate signal, of course, if you have you know, stormy years or less stormy years, I mean, we know that there's a difference in lightning tracks. The assumption in general in this part of the Southwest is that the landscape is essentially lightning saturated, and if you look at a, you know, a map of lightning strikes over, you know, the period of record, which is a, a couple decades at this point, you, there, there isn't a very strong discernible pattern for, you know, particular areas that are, you know, sinks for lightning. Um, but so that said, the the important part of this model isn't isn't necessarily. Um, what the variability in lightning strikes is from year to year to year. It's more about the interaction of ignitions and um, vegetation and fuels on the landscape. So, um, so we, we represent lightning in the pattern that we see from the minus the human, the human ignitions that we model. We represent lightning following the patterns that we see from the observed record, but not all of those lightning strikes become spreading fires, which is also tr very true in the real world, because not every one of those strikes falls on a place where there is fuel available to burn or where the topography supports spreading fire. Okay. Thank you. That's it. OK. OK. Um, OK, so, so what I'm showing now on the left is, is output from the model. Again, this is a spatial model, but um, these are data that are consolidated um, and it, it's uh, into these box plots. But so along the, the x-axis uh, for each of those panels is, is the time period that's represented. And again, that the middle time period and, and the one that's underlined in red is that area of, um, of large population relative to the, the other periods in that kind of bell-shaped population curve from the beginning of the slides. And so I'm showing four different um, metrics that come from this model, area burned, it's a panel A, fire size, um, that's an, and then fire intensity, and then tree mortality as a, as a percent of um, trees on the landscape killed. Um, and those are, are pretty common ways to look at um, fire behavior and fire or fire patterns and fire impacts. So um, what I hope stands out to you in particular in these time periods that are underlined in red is that there are only some time periods in which we see kind of a, a strong human signal. So the, 
I'm only looking at two scenarios here, and this is from um, again that 2021 paper. And we couldn't we couldn't compare all scenarios, and it's really hard to to look across all scenarios um, anyway. But so I'm showing in the gray a null scenario, so that's sort of baseline. No, we we assume no people, and we just run the model that way. And then orange is that most intensive use scenario that I'm going to jump back one slide that's on the far right here, that HPSF, HIA, high population, structural fuel would harvest, and then that high, that intensive agriculture land use. Um, and so what we see in the model is that in that time period, given that intensive uh, activity level or intensive um, uh, resource land use and land management by ancestral Hamish people, um, that we see some changes in the fire regime. And so the first of those is an increase in the area burned over those other time periods and over the, the no human scenario. And so that, that has to do with those added human ignitions. But if I can skip down to panel C, not all fire is created equal, right? And so um, in this case, what that increase in area burned translates to is a lower fire intensity. And you could think of that nearly as a lower fire severity. So more fire, but if we skip to panel D, um, fires that killed far fewer trees than the, the surrounding um, periods where humans had less of an influence. And then if we go around counterclockwise back up to fire size, Although the, the, the overall area burned during that time period was greater, um, the size of individual fires was smaller. And that's spread across about a, a 200,000 hectare uh, landscape that we modeled. Well, it, it turns out that when we look at those point-based tree ring records that I talked about, we see the same pattern. So before 1680, when during that period of higher population, what we see from the tree ring record are, is evidence of fewer widespread fires. So meaning individual fire sizes were smaller, um, but we still see a great number of fires on the landscape. And so in this case, the empirical record that was developed independently of, of this model um, reinforces the model, but what the model provides us with is a, a landscape scale look um, at that phenomena and also the a kind of a reinforcement of the type of human activities that might have created the pattern that we see in the tree ring record. So I told you it's a fire BGC in this case is a spatial model and so we're not doing the model justice if we don't look at the spatial patterns of fire. And so that's what I'm showing here and this is just for that period of highest occupation. And now I'm showing you in each of these, um, these panels, that's like a, I can't remember what that is, Shaka or something, right? Looks like that. Um, in each of those panels um, uh, is a different scenario and I'm showing uh, fire return intervals through time. So on the far left, we have the null scenario. So that's just a, a background scenario for comparison as if we assumed very incorrectly that there were no people on the landscape. And then we have that uh, high population, high fuel wood scenario, and then a whole series of scenarios from the, the top uh, far right all the way to the bottom far right, where we have varying levels of, of human land use, intensity of human land use that incorporate um, added ignitions and that agricultural land use. And, and basically what, what, what I hope that you see is that humans add Humans add fire to the landscape, and, and in this particular period, um, uh, do it in a way that matches the fire history record that we see. In other words, we don't, we don't really get the fire history record that we see, again, in the empirical data in tree cookies, um, unless we uh, factor in these added human ignitions. And, you know, the the again these these scenarios are sort of trajectories right they're they're bookends and so um, this is not meant to reconstruct a particular population level or or a particular you know biomass of fuel or number of sticks that were collected but but rather to represent the idea that in this case for this period of time um, uh, the natural fire regime as we understand it from fire history from ecological studies cannot be disentangled from 
this human footprint, that it absolutely required um, a, a human activity, a, a pretty substantial human activity level to match what we see um, in the biological record. And I, I find that to be um, pretty profound. And, and in fact, if we looked just at the species composition of the model, there's a, a whole, I mentioned that um, individual uh, tree species, individual stems, individual trees, and then also understory plant communities are explicitly represented. We, we don't get um, the picture, the, the profile, the, the composition and distribution of vegetation communities that we understand from fire and landscape ecology to be correct for the Southwest, unless we have the scenarios of, um, of intensive human land use. So the, the species, so in the graphs on the far right, we see time on the x-axis and an amount of landscape, um, that simulation landscape on the y-axis. The major species that, um, that are present on the landscape are in the different colors. And what we understand of ecosystems in the southwestern US and these forest types is that there's a, a strong dry forest component. So ponderosa pine, lower elevation juniper, pinyon pine. Um, if we get in, in, in areas and in times when we have a, you know, some fire activity, we see more gamble oak. But in particular, this grass component, which is the, the component of the vegetation community that carries um, fire across the landscape and is present when fires are um, of high frequency, low severity in a way that complements our southwestern forest types, um, that, that, those, that vegetation community is only present, um, again, with this uh, scenario of, of strong human interaction and, and land management. So um, I, I want to end with what I consider to be the central challenge number two, and this is where I hope that you all, um, that we can engage in, in ongoing discussions, because I think this is a really central point of this work. So um, I'll just read the slide from our work. It looks like the resilience of, of the cultural ecological landscapes of the Southwest was maintained through some kind of active management. So at, at periods in, in ancestral time when populations were uh, relatively large, when fuel wood collecting was required to be fairly intensive to the point where, um, where fuels were probably um, uh, removed in great mass from the landscape and where other activities like agricultural fields and trails and trampling fragmented fuels, all those things disrupted in general natural fire patterns, but the overall fire regime and forests were maintained via what, what I'm calling, you know, the use of fire, augmented humid ignitions and fire surrogates. So essentially um, some combination of prescribed fire and, and intentional or, uninten or, or inadvertent in, in, in the um, fuels treatments, inadvertent in the sense that um, these fuels treatments were a part of uh, everyday resource use. So this isn't knowing this information or believing this information isn't as clear a, a pathway toward land management as with um, reintroduction of fire to facilitate persistence or, or increase in distribution or abundance of, a, of an, a culturally important plant, right? Because, I mean, we're talking about kind of a, a fundamental interconnectedness of, of people, forests, and fire regimes, and maybe an understanding that humans were an incredibly integral and active part of the development of fire and forest regimes in the Southwest. So knowing that information and doing something with it aren't the same things. And so I guess I leave us all with this challenge. So if you believe this information, if you believe this context, um, what, what do we do with that information now? And that's where I'm gonna stop. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, we do have one, I think, quick question, which is, um, could you explain why 1680 is a reference date? Oh yeah. So uh, 1680 was the date of the, well, 1684, the Pueblo Revolt. Six, yeah, and so that's the period when the Hemish people, uh, well, and actually all of the Southwest rose up against uh, Spanish occupation. And so um, it's, a, it's a really important cultural marker and also kind of signifies a break between how people lived on the landscape, how free they were um, to how they, well, they were not living in a particularly free context before then, but, um, but it, it tends to be a kind of a cultural marker in the Southwest and in different parts of our project, you know, we had different kind of temporal benchmarks. And so for that, those results that I showed from the 
um, I think it's Tom Swetnam's paper, um, that was one benchmark that they used was pre-Pueblo versus post-Pueblo revolt. Um, okay, next question. Are you saying that the Hamas Mountains can only be maintained in a healthy functioning condition if fire and forest structure are intensively managed? Um, I, don't think, <laughs> I don't think in my job I'm actually allowed to answer that question because I work for the government. Uh, um, yeah, but that's a really good question. So, so I think that the message that this work suggests most strongly is that in the presence of human activities that insert themselves into um, into uh, an ecological system like that of the Hamas Mountains, that okay, so so fire is a is a is an integral part of the ecology of the Hamas Mountains, of the ecology of of someplace with a fire of within fire prone fire adapted forests those those vegetation communities need fire right and so if human activities human presence on the landscape a thousand years ago 500 years ago today tomorrow uh happens in such a way that fire is is interrupted in some manner through fire exclusion intentional fire exclusion maybe something like our contemporary land management or through um, the cessation of fire, the fragmentation of spatial fire patterns because of other human activities, the, the resilience or the persistence of fire prone fire adapted forests is best accomplished through some, um, some other human activities that, that reinstate, reintroduce or maintain that critical role of fire. And so I guess that's, that's what I, the point I was trying to make here is that, is that, is that, it, it appears that some of the activities that people's had in the past, like collecting lots of fuel wood, uh, uh, creating this very um, dense uh, built environment, agricultural fields, uh, all kinds of, of fuel fragmentation activities that, that should have resulted in basically a fire excluded forest. All of those things could have disrupted that tight coupling of fire adapted forests and fire except that part of those activities were, you know, a key part of all those activities was the maintenance of fire via intentional burning. So Amber is asking, in terms of use of resources, wouldn't the arrival of Spanish be more indicative in resource changes and utilization with human activities with different values changing the ecosystem? So, yeah, if I'm understanding the question, I mean, the arrival of the Spanish and grazing and changes in uh, settlement patterns of indigenous peoples did have a big effect. That That's not the period of time that we looked at in this particular project, except um, in the reconstruction of populations to reflect this, um, what, what seems to be a pretty precipitous decline in indigenous population, the I think it's 85% decline in the, the number of people living on this, of indigenous people living on this landscape. If that, I don't know if that answered the question. No, I can actually, Amber raised her hand. So Amber, I'm gonna allow you to talk and then that way you can, um, you know, answer if that clarified your question, answer your question. Awesome. Thank you, um, Sarah. And um, um, I'm sorry, Rachel, thank you. Thank you. So I guess, you know, my point is, is that it's important, you know, the 1680 revolution is I'm, I'm extraordinarily aware of it. However, I, I think just using, I mean, that to me, it is, it is a moment of in time in which, um, you know, there was a tremendous change. However, um, you know, really what, what was the impact on our ecosystems because of that? Um, I, what I'm saying is that, um, that really it's an important date, but what's more, um, I think, um, significant in terms of changes on resources and activities is the arrival of the Spanish. And you know, one of your major points was about um, uh, sheep grazing. 
And so, um, you know, with the arrival of Spanish folks came sheep. And so for me, the 1680, you know, um, date is important, but is it really, is that, is that the point that is most indicative for certain kinds of changes in this particular conversation? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a great point. Any other questions? Okay, well, we are at one o'clock. I did paste in the registration links for the next two webinars if you'd like to join us. Um, and of course, if you come up with you know questions later, feel free to email me and I can connect with Rachel. Um, and we have been recording this webinar, and so we will post that on our website, hopefully by tomorrow, and I'll send a follow-up to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, this was extremely informative and, um, and great work. Yeah, and thank you all. And uh, I, I would love to talk to anyone um, about any aspect of this work or extensions or ways to um, carry this on. So um, please contact me if, if you want to. Yeah. And Carolyn just popped on. So yeah, and I just wanted to say an extra word of thanks because I, I wasn't able to greet you and say hello, um, Rachel and our participants a little earlier. Um, but I'll just take the opportunity to say thank you for a really terrific um, presentation and thanks to all the participants for um, taking the time out of your day to spend with us and, and learn about this really important work. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Oh, it's Rachel.